My supervisory team throughout this project included Dr. Tristan Pierce, Dr. Javier Leon, and Ms. Rachel Wilson. Um, and firstly, before I uh, begin, I'd like to um, formally um, recognise the traditional custodians of the land in which we're meeting today, and to, to pay my respects to, to, um, to the elders past and present. My, uh, my research title is How Times Change, the use of traditional ecological knowledge to understand uh, of end science to understand changes in mangrove extent and implications for ecosystem services. Herein, traditional ecological knowledge is referred to as a cumulative body of knowledge um, generated through observations um, of and interactions with uh, the environment and, um, and of which this knowledge is uh, uh, passed on through generations. So what, why did we need to perform, why did we perform this research? Well, we know that mangroves occur specifically within the tropical regions of the globe, um, and many of these also um, occupy many um, estuarine ecosystems as well. They provide a number of fundamental ecosystem functions and services of which coastal, um, uh, coastal communities and organisms rely heavily upon. Um, namely, some of the functions include nutrient cycling and water filtration and coastal defense, while ecosystem services um, can incl uh, include the uh, production of uh, raw materials and uh, fish for food. Despite, the, um, despite their importance, however, mangroves um, have undergone unprecedented loss, particularly within recent decades. Um, estimates suggest that 35% of the total loss has occurred since 1980 alone. The loss of mangroves could further um, compromise uh, ecosystem services and functions. And our current understanding of mangroves heavily relies upon scientific methods. Um, and some of these methods can leave uh, spatial and temporal gaps in the knowledge. For example, you'll see here many ecological studies utilize um, this particular spatial data, uh, and it's obviously quite coarse, and you can't really make out um, what's actually within the landscape. There are other spatial data sets available. Um, for example, uh, high resolution. This is considered high resolution um, satellite imagery. And it comes at quite an extensive cost, it comes to $4,000 an image. While nowadays we also have access to drone imagery and aerial photography, uh, these are limited in their spatial extent of landscape observation, um, and they're also limited in their temporal scale, um, given that we can only, um, given that there's, yeah, there's a restricted time period as to um, how far back we can utilize this data. Therefore, with this, um, with this obvious gap, there's a need to integrate multiple knowledge platforms in order to truly understand the complex issue at hand and the environmental changes taking place. In order to fill, fulfill this gap, uh, fill this gap, sorry, um, my research aim was to understand changes in the spatial distribution and extent of mangroves within uh, of mangroves, um, and identify the drivers of change and highlight these impl the implications for ecosystem function and services. Specifically, the objectives of this research were to document changes in mangrove extent over time, um, identify key drivers of change with, with um, sorry, identify the key drivers of change, and examine the links between changes in mangrove extent and potential consequences for ecosystem services. Uh, this research was performed within the Maruchi uh, River on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. The landscape itself is largely largely characterised by low-lying, um, uh, by subtropical lowlands, and the area drains approximately, uh, sorry, more than half of the 640 square kilometres that make up the total catchment. Common land use within this area includes cattle grazing, sugarcane production, and urban development. The land is also traditionally owned by the Kabi Kabi Nation and has been occupied by their ancestors for more than 10,000 years. Given the complexity um, of this research, I, in, in, I drew upon um, two key sources of knowledge. Firstly, the use of traditional, eco traditional ecological knowledge, which was documented through a participatory mapping workshop, um, and that information was then utilized for a final map development of the area. Proposed uh, robust sampling methods were utilized to identify the pistols. This included purposive sampling and snowball sampling procedures, uh, and this allowed us to um, to identify key uh, traditional ecological knowledge holders. A map was also produced for this workshop, 
Um, this included a, a, a local scale, um, inclusive of a measured grid system, which allowed for digitalization of the final spatial data on the map. The workshop itself was conducted on country at um, Muller Park on Blybly on the Sunshine Coast in September of this year, and the process was largely guided by the research objectives. Um, the final, um, upon completion of the, of the exercise, the data were then digitized and integrated into a GIS for the final map production. The second source of knowledge that I drew upon through this research included um, uh, scientific methods, namely remote sensing, uh, and this, was all, this too was also used to um, generate a final map of the study area. The, um, the remote sensing data we used, um, we drew upon the Landsat satellite imagery spatial archive, and this provided data spanning from 1983 to 2015. Um, following this data, following the, the collection of this data, I worked collaboratively with Bunya Bunya Country Aboriginal Corporation to further identify the more specific study area. From here, radiometric calibrations and corrections were performed on the spatial data in order to um, correct any atmospheric distortions and minor instrumentation errors and enhance our overall accuracy. Calculations of spectral indices were then performed. Namely, we utilized two indices here. Uh, this was the normalized difference vegetation index and the modified normalized difference water index. Uh, these two indices in particular are well used, um, uh, sorry, used uh, across a number of ecological studies and are known to, um, to be quite effective in um, monitoring um, mangrove vegetation distribution. From here, the data were then separated into two individual data sets. Um, the reason for this was because of instrumentation uh, limitations of the earlier data, which did not allow for the calculation of the images that we like. A non-parametric classification approach was then chosen to classify land cover, and this was performed within an artificial neural network. Um, artificial neural networks are typically known to be more um, a more robust form of classification um, than, um, than a number of other classification um, processes. From here, um, the accuracy, an accuracy assessment was performed of the data, um, and we were aiming for um, a minimum, minimum overall accuracy of approximately 7%. Following, uh, once we achieved this, um, the final classification algorithm from the artificial neural network was then utilized to um, uh, classify the remaining data set. And finally, just to, um, to really um, capture the, the entirety of, um, of information available, we drew upon secondary sources. Uh, these included population data of the area dating back to 1911. Um, Physico-chemical measure, uh, measurements, which were taken at various points within the river system itself, and annual report cards to, um, of um, river health. Ultimately, combining, all, um, combining these knowledge systems allowed us to more accurately assess changes um, in mangrove uh, extent and distribution, and highlight implications for ecosystem services. The results of my research illustrate that distribution was um, more widespread pre-colonization. Um, the, the image on the left is digitized data from the participatory mapping exercise, which highlights um, approximate mangrove distribution prior to uh, European colonization in the mid to late 1800s. And as you can see, it's um, quite wide, widespread throughout the study area um, and quite uniform also with little fragmentation of any habitat. The image on the left um, illustrates the final map production of our um, spatial data, uh, of the classification of our spatial data. Um, in particular, the, uh, the green highlights areas of mangrove vegetation that has remained the same dur um, throughout the duration of the study um, of the data set, while the, um, the orange further highlights areas of vegetation that have under undergone change um, and are now uh, considered uh, to be free of mangrove vegetation. You'll notice that the area is quite uh, fragmented in comparison to the, uh, the participatory mapping um, information. Our data here also suggests that um, an estimated 16.5% of mangrove uh, vegetation has declined throughout the study area over the duration of the spatial data, um, with the largest habitat loss seen around uh, Blybly, to the southern end of Blybly, uh, around near Maruchador itself, around Markula, and to the northwestern extent um, of of the study area up near Coolum Creek. Uh, secondary sources also, um, well, secondary sources found little change within the region. 
uh, population data do see <coughs> uh, a dramatic increase, particularly within recent years. However, the, chemi uh, the physicochemical measurements and the um, uh, ecosystem health assessments of the report card illustrated um, little change. Um, key drivers um, of change within the river system were also highlighted. This was mainly through the participatory mapping exercise. Um, firstly, farming and agricultural practices um, shortly following colonization were seen to have the greatest impact on mangrove extent throughout the region. Urbanization was also highlighted as a, a um, contributing factor to, um, to mangrove decline. And although, this, uh, although um, urbanization has been occurring since colonization, um, in more recent years it has um, had a, a greater effect. And thirdly, pollution and sewage discharge was also noted. Um, with specific events in 1999, 2008 and 2012, uh, leading to localised fish kills, noxious weed growth, and degraded water quality to name a few impacts. The um, analysis of the participatory mapping workshop data, our spatial data, and the secondary sources highlighted a number of implications for ecosystem services throughout the region. Uh, the first category included coastal protection. Uh, you can see here now by the image um, that mangrove extent is quite limited with only a, hand few, uh, a handful of, of small um, mangrove vegetation. And you can also note that extensive erosional processes are occurring within this region. Water purification was also identified. Um, the loss of mangrove vegetation throughout the study area has, um, have, may, have potentially, um, may have potential impacts for filtration services provided by mangroves, leading to extensive sediment loading and nutrient loading within the waterway itself. Biodiversity throughout the region has also been um, largely impacted. Following colonization, the removal of large scale and biodiverse mangrove habitat and a replacement with sugarcane monocultures um, has not only affected the diversity of mangrove species <coughs> themselves, but may have implications for, uh, may have cascading in, uh, in implications for a number of ecosystems, um, sorry, a number of um, organisms that rely on the mangrove. And finally, cultural services have also been um, greatly impacted. Um, with a number of site, a number of, um, of uh, culturally, culturally significant sites located throughout the study area, and the removal um, of the mangrove vegetation for agricultural practices has decimated a large number of these. And even today, um, these the cultural services are still threatened from urbanization and the onset of privatized land. So what does this I guess, what does this all really mean? Well, we know that now in the, in the past century, aggressive land use practices such as agriculture and farming and urbanization have removed extensive areas of mangrove habitat throughout the area. And despite the recognition of the importance of mangrove habitats within recent years and their, now, um, and their protection under Queensland law with the Fisheries Act of 1994, we're still witnessing a decline in mangrove vegetation throughout the area. The availability of technology and spatiotemporal data may actually um, also in, uh, restrict effective management practices to mitigate this. Um, an example here I'd like to, I'd like to show that I took earlier this year um, of the impacts uh, or the, the contrasted effects with um, what's going on within the region is we have protection of the mangroves now under the, the Fisheries Act, yet urbanization um, continues, as you can see here, with the extension of the revetment adjacent uh, Brabham Avenue and Maruchidor. Um, and this, this um, essentially inhibits, uh, inhibits recovery or effective recovery and management of the mangroves. Um, so it's kind of a little counterintuitive, I'd say. Um, it was extremely important to integrate traditional ecological knowledge uh, for this particular research. Given that um, DEK was able to extend ava the availability um, of data across both spatial and temporal scales given the, the, specifically the temporal scales associated with our, um, our spatial data, uh, suggest with um, satellite imagery itself um, dating back to 1972 um, at the earliest stage. Um, and spatially as well, there are restrictions in the capacity of sensor uh, resolution in order to effectively assess the landscape. TEK also highlighted changes unseen in the satellite imagery and documented by secondary data and it identified stresses um, driving change otherwise unidentified in our spatial data, once again due to the temporal um, and spatial restrictions. 
So TEK and science both agree that the map that's to manage for that mangrove forest size, sorry, and structure are key attributes pertaining to adequate ecosystem function and services. Declining mangrove extent places um, further pressure on these ecosystems and um, places them at risk of reaching an ecological tipping point, which may have a number of effects on, um, on organisms relying on these uh, habitats. Um, for example, with 75% of recreational and commercially fished species alone reliant on the mangrove vegetation within the Maroochee River system, uh, this clearly highlights the significance that mangroves play. Um, in summary, previous studies of mangroves have been spatially and temporally restricted. Um, mangrove extent has also continued to decline. Uh, because of this, in order to overcome certain gaps in this knowledge, um, TEK, where TEK exists, we suggest it should be used um, and included within studies of ecosystem health and change. Um, the reason for this is because coupling TEK and science provides in, provided new um, environmental insights and observations, uh, which can be used to guide effective management practices. It is also suggested that legislative practices be extended to protect areas of historic mangrove rather than maintaining an already heavily compromised ecosystem. And furthermore, assessment of ecosystem health should be based on pre-colonization conditions. Uh, that concludes my presentation today. Um, thank you for that. Um, before I go, I'd just like to um, specifically thank uh, the members of Bunya Bunya Country Aboriginal Corporation for your continued support throughout this research project. Um, and the University of the Sunshine Coast for having me uh, throughout the duration of my honours. It's been a stressful and excellent time. <laughs> and to the um, Environmental Change Research Group again for um, your continued support of this project. Thank you. With the spatial data approach, because of the spatial limitations and, and limitations associated with um, software packages like the GIS and the new neural networks, um, it tended to classify or blend um, a couple of other land cover types together, and that yeah that did that did have an influence on. of classifying mangroves, not mangroves, or just classifying individual habitats, and if so, how many? Because um, yeah, the, the classification approach we used was to um, distinctly identify between mangrove and non-mangrove vegetation. Then do you think 75% 70, 70 accuracy is enough? I mean, 50-50 is random. Yes. <laughs> um, again, uh, with the limitations associated with, the, with spatial um, data analysis, um, multiple studies um, have have worked towards trying to enhance the accuracy. Obviously, the better the accuracy, and the better the results, are, and, and the better we can influence um, like management practices. Um, but within the literature, um, most studies sort of uh, fell between the 70% to the 85% accuracy, particularly when we were using um, the data, the spatial data in our research. With, a, with an extremely coarse resolution, yeah. yeah. Um, we were, we utilised the this is a Landsat 8 satellite imagery um, with a 30 meter pixel resolution. So it's quite coarse. Uh, once again, you can better that for accuracy yeah. with higher yeah. resolution. Uh, you said you had Landsat data from 1983 to 2013. Yes. So that makes 32 years, and you said you had an annual decline of 16.6 towards you know, 530% being very quickly run out of mangroves. So you might want to check that figure before you put it up. Um, I did forget to mention, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, the data that we did use throughout this, uh, due to limitations in the, in the um, spatial data of some earlier imagery, they had to be removed from the, um, the, study, area, the study itself. So the images were performed across, uh, the spatial data was analyzed across um, data from 1994. It's still more than 100%, even if it was in 1994. You can only have seven years, and you very quickly run out of 100%. Well, if you lose 16% of a smaller amount, you're losing 16% of a smaller amount all the time. You actually never go below zero. Is it an average? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. yeah, essentially, yeah. That I mean, the, the, it did vary from year to year according to our analysis. However, that was just a, a calculated average. 
Um, there's there's been a, a few studies uh, lately which has seen to I guess integrate traditional ecological knowledge into these kind of studies. Do you think it's uh, it's a fad, or do you think uh, we're going to move forward with this? Excellent question. Um, I I think it's a, a, a valid um, source of information, um, and once again highlighting the the, um, the gaps associated with contemporary um, some contemporary scientific method. I think we, we should be drawing upon this. Um, it's actually received uh, recognition um, globally in recent years with the Conference of the Parties, um, the 21st Conference of the Parties, recognising um, the potentials for incorporating traditional ecological knowledge into climate change research. Um, and furthermore, actually just on the um, Conference of the Parties currently undertaken um, in Marrakesh at the moment, they're now moving towards looking at um, operationalising the use of traditional ecological knowledge into climate change research. So I think that this will only continue sampling not just doing the same thing you just you, you're finding something that you like and you stick with that you don't get a diversity of opinion um, excellent excellent question thank you um, the reason we went for snowball sampling um, was to was to extend the, um, the the sample size to other patrons or holders of traditional ecological knowledge that we um, wouldn't otherwise know or have access to and this was done through um, bunya bunya so it was it was more um, I guess specifically um, yeah, identified rather than being an, an overall generalization. Yeah, so it's just, just something to be careful of is you're not actually increasing the degrees of freedom, you're just getting more of the same. You may be adding to your knowledge base, but you're not actually okay. getting contradictory opinions because you're more likely to pick someone if you ask somebody to, to, to study somebody else to ask, they're going to pick someone who's going to agree with what they've said. That's just human nature. So it's, it's just a caveat. Yeah, not, no, not really. Um, we did look at extending that beyond mangroves, looking at salt marsh, and then looking into um, the, the, the migration of the, the riverbank itself, or uh, bank erosion. Um, however, <laughs> with the, the, the time scale that we had um, and the, the availability of um, yeah, our data available, um, we sort of had to confine the scope a little bit further. Um, however, th that could potentially definitely be a, um, another research project that could um, utilise the traditional ecological knowledge and also draw upon uh, scientific sources. Yeah, I think the concept was very interesting, but challenging just for one project. Um, certainly it leads into a much bigger project. Yes, definitely. It was very much a challenge. Yeah. Uh, we've got lots of questions, but we've run out of time, sorry. Um, we'll let Matt be off the hook, so thank you very much. Thank you.